they turn the volume down on the big speaker for everybody, and then my head, I smile. Okay. You, you let me know if, if all of a sudden I go away. And if I actually go away, you guys come and help me. Um, Could be the rapture. <laughs> so, so more like the sleep of the dead for me. The, the thing that I wanted to do, and if you, if you got a copy of my email, what I put on it for tonight was sharing our house. Now we've talked about building a house, but really you don't build a house and leave it empty, right? You, you fill it up with people and activities and stuff. You know, stuff is another problem, but... Um, so I wanted us to kind of think about what is it that, that we have to share as a house? I mean, what is, in practical terms, what does that mean? Uh, but I wanted to, to uh, read part of that same portion that John quoted this morning from Levitical Writings 301 because I think it's important that we understand what we've been called to do. I mean, we've been called to build a house, but what does that really mean? I mean, when I decided to build my house, our house, we put together a plan and figured out what we were going to build and we went about the process and eventually it was completed and we moved in. Well, it's pretty much complete. But, <laughs> yeah, we've been called to build this house, so I want to start with our instructions to begin with. It says, because you have suffered for them, this is that, that sea of people that, uh, that Bishop observed, uh, that were confused. Uh, they didn't know who they were. They didn't know what was going on. It says, because you have suffered for them and have taken compassion upon you for them, it is now given to you to build a house for them. And it shall be built as the house of the Lord that he may dwell therein with those of the sons of Aaron and Levi and Reuben and Dan and Joseph, Benjamin and all of the tribes of Israel. Okay, if, if we can focus on that part of it. Now, recognize that's not the only thing it might be used for, but that's our initial set of instructions. So it's pretty clear that, that this house is related to Israel. It's a call to Aaron and Levi uh, to build a house that includes Aaron and Levi. So like we did at, at uh, Pesach, we, we built a house and we had our little, little piece of the action in there. So to build this house, we know that it has to be shared. And, and that's part of our challenge. You know, how many of you grew up in bedrooms where there was more than one sibling in that room? How many of you ever wanted your own room? And how many of you wanted your siblings to never enter that room? Okay. Maybe you can see the, the problem that we may have to face here. Okay. So, I kind of wanted to spend just a little bit of time walking us through this process, uh, or, or our thinking uh, about, well, what does Shavuot have to do with building the house? And, and the first part is, here we are, just finishing the 49th day of counting the Omer. Okay? So, why seven sevens? We were fed all of this brain food for dinner. Why seven sevens? And, and this is audience participation. Why do you think? Because it's not 49, by the way. It's seven sevens. So why is that? Well, I mean, simply, it's a week of weeks. Okay, a week of weeks. But in biblical thinking, it's almost like perfection. Okay, John says like perfection. Because if you recall, seven is that completion of a process. Uh, I like to use the term cycles because we... God always does things in cycles, except you don't come back to where your footprints were in the forest. You're not lost. You're, you're moving up, if you want to think of it in three-dimensional terms. But it, it occurred to me, what happened in the wilderness? What, what happened after those seven sevens when they left Egypt? 
Come on. Okay. What happened before they wandered, though? Well, the presence of God came down on the mountain. Yeah. They received the Torah, right? I mean, isn't that's part of what we're celebrating. One of the symbolisms is that the Torah was the marriage covenant, the wedding covenant, the ketubah. They were told to prepare for the third day. Right. They were told to prepare. So, at the end of those seven sevens, they received their instructions, right? Isn't that what Torah means, is instructions? Now look at what happened in the time of Yeshua. It says when Pentecost had fully come. That, that means the 50th day, by the way. After the seven sevens, what happened? The Holy Spirit came. Where are you supposed to get your instructions now? From the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's one of the songs that we sang. It says, you explained the Torah to us through your Ruach. Okay, so, so we understand this process of the seven sevens, at least I'm looking at it this way, as it's time to receive our instructions. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only time you ever get instructions. But it is significant for the people. This, this time of... Uh, of Shavuot is a, is a time of expectation when we should have a sense that we're moving on in a, at least in our understanding okay so it to me it's one of the things that we celebrate one of the songs we sang was Simchat Torah rejoice in the Torah but to me that's a little too broad it's rejoice in the understanding of Torah that we've been given because that's what brings meaning to your life right Okay, so, so we've been told to do that. What, what have we done to this point? What do we feel is completed? And I'm talking about our house in this day. Do you have some sense of things that are fundamental, foundational, that are done, that we build on from here? Does the roof leak? Well, hopefully not, it was fixed. But, I mean, we have a lot of physical facilities that are completed, right? You know, one, one of the instructions in the Levitical writings is that none among you may suffer. Now, if you're left to define suffering on your own, you know, we have to talk. But really, we're not in a situation where we're suffering. And just, this is extra credit. Um, what do you think we are suffering from? We'll take that as a rhetorical question. Okay. Do you have some idea of what's next? Okay, because we recognize that when they stopped at Sinai, they received all these instructions, they had a lot of things they had to do, but what was their next opportunity? Yeah, they sent the spies out. They were getting ready to find out what kind of a land God was gonna give them. Now there was a little problem with that process. And so somebody said it, they wandered next, okay? That was because of unbelief, and it's one of the great examples in, in Hebrews uh, when, when the people of Israel were described and the rest was described and they're not entering my rest and all that other kind of stuff. Well, we recognize that Yeshua came so that that would not be the problem because what do we have that keeps us from having to go wandering. The Holy Spirit, right? So this is our big chance. I mean, every year we celebrate uh, Shavuot. I, I think we need to be thinking of it as this is our next chance to, to make progress. I, I think it's an exciting time, okay? So that's one of the first, the first things about finishing counting the Omer that I think we ought to keep in mind. Because God doesn't do one step forward and two steps back. Just remember that. It may seem like that to us, but if that's your case, that's discipline. You know, there, there's a big difference between, uh, between not making progress and having to go backwards. So, okay, so I want to kind of have us think about our own house for a while here. And some of this is history. 
and I'm glad Doug and Karma are here and Jerry and Colleen and uh, no but you know a lot of history and because every time one of these subjects comes up Doug is always saying did you know that and I have to say no I hadn't a clue so we'll look to Doug for maybe some of these answers and Jerry and okay we'll throw her in the mix too then okay so th this is kind of in the fun facts area right now did you know the 2018 is the 75th anniversary of the organization of the House of Aaron? Yep. March 8th, 1943, Maurice Glendening was given what we know as Levitical Writings 232 that says, rebuild to me the order of Aaron. Okay? On August the 18th of that year, the House of Aaron was incorporated. It was incorporated as the Aaronic Order slash Order of Aaron. Okay? And then it was reincorporated about a month later with more of the, the names that we're more familiar with. Uh, House of Aaron was added, I forget. In, True, Church True Church of God, yeah. Anyway, it's all here in Chapter 7 of Now My Servant. So think about that. 75 years, we have been an organized religious corporation. And do you know what our stated purpose was? So let me read that to you. It says, the corporation of the president of the Aaronic Order, a corporation soul, the purpose for the incorporation is for the acquiring, holding, and disposing of church or religious society properties for the benefit of religion, for works of charity, and for public worship. Okay? Now, what that'll get you at that point in time is a 501c3 designation as a nonprofit charitable organization. But the reality of it is that's pretty much what goes along with Levitical Writings 301. It says you're to build a house for all of these people who are confused, don't know who they are, don't know what's going on, because you've got to be able to receive everybody that God brings. Okay? So when you think about sharing our house, who are we going to share it with? A lot of people who don't know who they are. Yeah, every Tom, Dick, and Harry, says Margo. So, so think about that. Now, part of the historical part, who was the first president of the organization? Okay, Maurice L. Glendening. Okay, who was the second president? Edwin Lee. Yeah. Yep, they did that so that Bishop could go do all of his genealogical research and all the other things he had to do to run around and, and uh, I mean, there was a lot of historical work that was going on for him. There were a lot of writings still being given. I mean, there was a lot of work for him to do. So he didn't retain that role. Now, who were some of the original Supreme Council members, the board of directors? Is, as they were called. Okay, yeah, I mean... It, okay, Claude Waite, my grandfather, was one of them. Um, no, I don't, I don't know, actually. I don't think Claire was. Claire was. I think Claire was, and I think Ernest might have been. Who? Ernest? I think... Well, he might... There was, there's a picture, but it's not the original Supreme Council. I think it's one of the older Supreme Councils, and on that one, Floyd, Ernest, and some. Mm -hmm. Doug says that may have been uh, later. Yeah. That the, the first one, I'm not sure. Okay. The reason I point this out is that we have less and less direct connection to the founders uh, of this house. Okay. Does that make anybody feel bad? Yeah, yeah in some way. 
Okay. Yeah. See, I'd, there are a lot of names I've heard and don't know anything about right. the people. What we don't want to do is forget that they existed. Right. Okay? And so I think one of the things that goes on in a house, and particularly a large house, in the, in the biblical context of a house, you have, you have a tribe that's associated with a house. And you have clans that are associated with their house. And then you have families, and they're associated with their house. So there is, in a sense, I'll say, a house of Faber and a house of Conrad and a house of, of Childs, and if you want to think of it in those kinds of terms, okay? But when you roll that up into the house of Aaron, which, by the way, and I did just a really quick check, before Levitical Writings 232, I don't think the term house of Aaron is used. I think it's only House of Levi. And so I try to put myself in the frame of mind that Bishop might have been in, given the information he had to work with at the time. He was as confused by some of those things as we've been trying to read them again. Except he lived through it. We don't even have the, the, the physical context that he had to work with. So we lose a little something there as far as what our roots are, where we came from. Okay, we know there were a lot of other families. There were, there was uh, Walt Faber. There were, yeah, Fred Fink. He's also, I think, one of the early uh, Supreme Council members. Um, who? Joe Peterson. Joe Peterson. See, there are a lot of people that we've been associated with, and and. I'm probably at more of a disadvantage than some of you because I didn't live here for decades and decades while some of this was going on. But we need to recognize how connected we are uh, over this period of time, this 75 years and actually earlier, that's just the official portion of it. Uh, there were a lot of people who, were, who understood what was going on. Yeah. Okay, that's a good example. When they were in the wilderness, God said to Moses, you build me a tabernacle, and you build it just like this, and this is how you furnish it. Who did all the work? Do you remember guys like Aholiab, and who was the other guy? Bezalel. Bezalel. They had no skill before they were called to do the work. And it's exactly the sentiment that Maurice Glendening is expressing in 301. I, I don't know how to do this. Yeah, I, I see where you're going a little bit. But in my mind, you know, we look at the wilderness as being this training ground, and there was a distinct, abrupt disconnect. Even when the word was coming down the mountain, the, the children of Israel had no idea of even what was what was happening. Here's the lightning and thunder and the mm -hmm. storm on the mountain, meaning God was there giving his word, and they had no clue. And so God says, well, I want you to build me out. And yet he knew that there was no way that they could do this. In fact, he voted into some of this instruction saying, I know this is going to happen, but remember that if you remember my word and follow it, this, these are the results. These are the blessings you'll have. But I know you're going to struggle with this, so here's the consequences. So what makes them qualify? What makes us qualify to even think that we can build a house? Because I've been at, I've been at this for a long time. And I keep asking myself, what, what am I doing to build a house? I'm doing something. And I know that God's called me to certain things to do and to be faithful in what he's doing. But we, we, I don't know what it is, but we're still struggling with this idea that we have no clue of even the shape of the house. 
we have no clue of the materials to be used with the house, and yet we have this thing that says build a house. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense after all of the time that we spent going around expending energy to build a house. And it's like we're going around in the circles in the wilderness. Okay, so what's the what was the principal reason that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness? What well, what was the principal result of them wandering in the wilderness? That's right. The old generation had to die because they were too instilled with their past. Yes, but they also complained. And they complained. And they did not, they couldn't see beyond the, all the stuff yeah. they were dealing with. Yeah. So, so we recognize what a grip the past has on us. Now, if you are able to kind of put yourself back into the Founding Fathers' Day, I think you would get a new appreciation for these people that gave their lives because they gave up their lives for a new life. And that's what they had to be ripped from their past. We have no appreciation of how they actually experienced that. It's like Hebrews chapter 11. We just have to say they were heroes and we bless them for their work because we're building on it. Now, granted, Greg, we don't have all of the answers, and we've had our share of problems, and we've probably done a little bit of murmuring here and there uh, on our own. But God didn't say, it's over. So, so we have a future. What did, what did he say in Jeremiah? I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, plans for to prosper you, and I think it's to give you a hope and a future or something along those lines, okay? So, so that's one of the things we've got to hang on to, and, and I'll get to that as we get down here a little farther. I'd like to just make a comment here. We grew up in the Mormon church, most of us as young children. Mm -hmm. So when we came to the meetings, many of the meetings were patterned after some of the things they did. We sang our own songs. We didn't know any of the hymns like you see in the hymn book. So Bishop introduced the hymn singing on Tuesday nights. For one hour, we would come and sing through songbooks. And then it ended up, he sent it all the young people, or the majority of us, to Colorado Springs to a new exposure. I mean, it was drastic. We went to the first uh, revival that they had at the first church there, the Holiness Church. And when the guy ran down the aisle, he was sitting behind me and went, <laughs> down jumped over the altar. I was looking for the back door. <laughs> <laughs> About scared us all to death. Where are we? What's going on? But what that did in those 10 years, it drew out of us a lot of that tradition and incorporated new things that we experienced, the new songs, the, the association of other people. And we still see a lot of that today. Now we're still suffering from the old pass away and I guess that's us now. <laughs> well there's you, you know you can talk about old in terms of chronology right, but, no. but I think you have to talk about old in terms of thinking because it's it's the people who can't acquire anything new that are really old and and so as long as as you're able to uh, to apprehend and participate in new things without it being uh, the fear of death um, I mean, it, for a lot of our parents who went through the 50s and rock and roll, that's, that's what it felt like to them. I mean, and then you get to the 60s and it's like, ah, I gotta leave this. Anyway. Okay, well, I wanna move on, but Doug kind of, kind of brought us to, uh, to a good point. How many locations can you think of that the House of Aaron in some form has existed in? Places. Okay, I mean, pretty much started out in the Provo Springville area. Okay. Well, Salt Lake. Well, Salt Lake, okay. I used to meet in Provo Springville when I was Okay. So, yeah, Provo, Springville, Salt Lake, um, 
uh, Jerry and Denise's place in Orem uh, was one of the, that's when the branch was there. Uh, Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. Church in Springville. Okay, California. And Cleon and Carla, even now, they yeah. hold church services in their home back in Illinois. Back in Illinois. Arlo and Julie in Independence. Independence. Jerry and Colleen in Indiana with And you had the Sturdivant in Cheyenne. Right. Wyoming. And Wyoming. And Laramie. I don't think anybody has said Partone. 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 Yeah, I mean with Wasatch Branch, obviously. Right. That was the old Murray Fire Station. I think I was in McKean's Catering more than I was anywhere else, which is really cool on a Saturday because nobody was in there. Sawmill. We were talking about that earlier. Now it's covered with water. Okay. Boise. We've got, we've got Dan and Melanie up there. Um, where else can you think? I mean, we got Cindy down in California. Uh, the people down in, uh, in Arizona. Oregon. And Oregon. Okay, it, it's not like we're isolated to this place. This place seems to have been the focal point, the, the nexus, if you will. Um, but recognize that we are probably known in a lot of places we don't know about. And, and uh, there, there are good stories about some of those things. Okay, here's, here's a uh, question for you. How many members, and I'm using baptism records, have there been since the beginning of the organization? No idea. A lot. Over 760. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, think about that. Now these are people who, I mean some of them may not be alive anymore, but, but in the main, these are people that were associated with this organization to the point where they were baptized and they are in other places. Now, I think part of scattering seed may be part of building the house because the house is for the people. You can build the house by gathering the family. The house may be a structure. It's the problem we have in confusing the word church with ecclesia, the assembly. So any time we are out spreading the word, and I appreciated the video that we had this afternoon because that's really what was, what was going on there, is they were spreading the word through power. And that all came from the Holy Spirit. But that's building the house. You know, that's gathering up some of those who are confused and don't have their identity. But God wants every one of those people in his house. Yeshua said, I go to build a place for you. And, and that was not just a plural you. That, that's true for every one of us. Okay? So, yeah, I was pretty impressed when I, when I added up all those numbers. We are at 67? Yeah. And I think I was 62 or 63. Um, the last one was... Johnny. Kaya. Johnny. It was Johnny, that's right, it was Johnny. Okay, now there's always been some undercurrent that 70 was the magic number and we just needed to find three more and we'd be good. <laughs> Somehow I don't sense that God would work that way. That's like buying a lottery ticket and expecting to win. Um, yeah, one of the things about, about the places we've been in our history, when, when uh, David was, or I guess it was when Ina's brother died, we were having church in Salt Lake and Gordon said, oh, I went to high school with him. I had no idea that Gordon was connected to anybody else in there because I didn't know any of those old families. You know, from, and I'll say old in the chronological sense, from back during those, those founding periods of time. But one of the things I've learned in working with some of this relief mine history 
is how many of the families uh, that were part of, of the Order of Aaron worked on that relief mine in there. No I, I mean, it's incredible. And so, you know, I look at that and I say, well, I know my grandfather Waite wasn't crazy, and I'm pretty sure all of those other people weren't either. But they were certainly motivated, and I believe by the Spirit, to believe something uh, th that made them join in with that. You know, that's all part of building the house, too. You know, we, we have a lot of potential relatives, uh, people in our family, uh, that we're going to include in our house at some point. And, and that's always tricky. Did you ever have anybody show up at your door and say, can I stay with you? I'm your cousin. <laughs> that you knew? Yeah. <laughs> it, it reminds me. I don't know. How many of you re know who W.C. Fields was? I just know he's a comedian. Okay, yeah. He, he was a comedian with quite a reputation. And he, his most famous saying was, Go away, kid. You bother me. Well, he was, uh, I don't know, profligate is the word that comes to my mind. Um, and it was rumored that he had lots of illegitimate children. But people would come to his door and say, I'm your lost, lost, long lost son. And he'd say, well, come on in, let's have a drink. And the guy would say, oh, I don't drink. And he said, you can't be my relative. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one of the problems that we're going to have to deal with is what I'll call validation or identification. Now, we understand that, that there's a patriarchal role where people will come to understand where they fit. And, and it's pretty low level for us. It was very important at the beginning of our organization because we had to know who was Levi, who was Aaron. Maurice Glendening was obviously gifted with a lot of understanding about that. And it says in this day that, that the chief high priest will have knowledge of these things when it's necessary. I mean, it's not something that that we run across all the time. And we're also told that there are other people who will, you know, we have to trust. I, I like the story John told about the, about the prophet when he was told to go to the king. Um, not so much because of the way it ended, but to recognize that there were always prophets in Israel. There were people who knew things. God told them, in this day of the Holy Spirit, should we have any reason to believe that God would not tell us what we needed to know when we need to know it? We, we have to believe that he will do that for us. So, so gathering people into our house shouldn't be a scary thing from the standpoint of being worried about the gang members infiltrating us. I mean, we're told to watch out for deception. But we have to be careful that we don't get more worried about being deceived than we do about doing God's work. Exactly. Because that's just fear. Exactly. Okay, so what we need is wisdom. What we've got to get rid of is fear. Right. Okay? So I, I think that's kind of a general concept that, that we need to be thinking about as we celebrate the Holy Spirit. Because God does not deal in fear. And, and if what we're feeling is fear, something's wrong. Okay. Yeah. I really appreciate the idea of this effort of building and constructing. I think it's there I think it's valid. I think it's 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 a good good thing. Um I just had an image cross my mind. Um, in this house that we're constructing we have a lot of open doors. Why? <laughs> we, have, we have wards that are missing. We have wards that, that are, have been torn out, if you will. And so our, our walls of our house, whatever, they, they're not as strong and fully constructed as they should be. And so if we're going to, say, build a house, there, there are wards. And I know of some of these boards that say, I'm not a part of that. 
Well, and, I'm just not a part of that anymore. And, and, and so can a board in a house just say, I don't want to be a part of that house anymore? But, but isn't the real question is, is there a board that goes in that place? See, yeah. see one, this is one of the things, though, that I think challenges us. And, and it goes really to my next point. What's, what's our level of willingness to participate in this process? You know, there's the old maxim about fish and relatives stink after three days. You know, it, if we're in that camp, then we're not really wanting these people to show up. Okay, you, you, you don't get to pick your relatives. That's, that's part of our problem. And, and I'll take this down to Levi and Aaron because we're, we're going to be faced with situations where we have Levites and Aaronites that we have to figure out how to establish this family relationship with. And, and we don't get to choose. Now, maybe that board has another place and we tried to put it in the wrong place. God's in charge of moving all of those things around. Okay? But the first thing we got to say is God does not make a bad plan. Okay. The second thing you have to say is he doesn't tell you to do something you can't accomplish. Okay. Now, you may need some more training, which is kind of a little detour. But when I built my house, I'd never built a house before. I bought a nail gun and a sawzall. Okay. And a long extension cord. And the, one winter I built a small shed because I just love things you can pull the trigger on and stuff comes out the end. That, that excites me. But I built that house because I wanted to build it. I didn't build it because I knew how. In fact, the first wall I put up, I had to cut out. And, and I decided then that the Sawzall is a more important tool because it can fix a problem you can create with a nail gun. It's a reciprocating saw. You hold it with both hands and it cuts really fast. And through nails. So, so kind of back to yours, Greg. I don't expect that we're going to have all the answers as we build this house until we need them. And, and the reason I say that is my second example is when I was working with the, with the building inspectors in Delta. And, and I was getting ready to cover up a jump bunch of stuff with drywall. And I called him up and I said, will you come out and inspect this? Because I got the drain plumbing all tested out and everything. And he says, well, he says, there's no loan on the place and you got to live there. If it's okay with you, it's fine with me. Because <laughs> he knew that if that drain plumbing leaked into my crawl space, I was going to fix it because I lived there. And, and it's one of the ways we have to look at our house. It's not just a place we live in. It's a place we live with our family, with our house. Yeah, that's going to mean there are kids running up and down the stairs and tracking mud in the back door and all that other kind of stuff. I mean, you have kids, you know how that works. And, and it's going to be a messy place, you know. We talked with our own at length uh, when we had the chance, and he said, one thing about Jews is that you are always a Jew. It doesn't matter if you've been a bank robber or a thief or a liar or any, you are always a Jew. Now, the family deals with all of those other behavioral issues, but you're always part of the family. And, and that's an attitude I think we're going to have to to work on because for a long time we've been so isolated we never expected anybody to show up. It's exactly what happened with the LDS church when Maurice Glenn Denning went in there and said, I'm a literal descendant of Aaron. And they said, we don't think any of them are ever going to come. And that was the end of it. We don't want to miss those kinds of opportunities if God brings them to us. But that requires an attitude, an inclusive attitude. So not only do we have to be willing, in my mind, we have to develop the desire to want them.
I built that house because I wanted to build a house. And I had a really good time doing it until it came down to drywall and painting and I called Steve. Because <laughs> I don't do that kind of stuff very well. So maybe we'll have to go out and find a few people in our house to help us put the boards in. But you know, more is always better when you're doing that kind of work. But if we have the desire for our house, that really is where it all starts. Because God will honor that desire. He'll give us what we need. He'll give us the skill to do the work of building the gold and whatever else uh, those two craftsmen did. And by the way, they were able to teach other people to do those same things. So, I don't think that's our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is what do we want? What's our desire? Yeah. I, I think for since our trip to Israel um, and, and on our, our association that we're starting to develop more and more with B'nai Yosef, um, I think part of, I know, I know part of what the Father's doing with me is broadening my scope of how large this house really is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, and our part, because we are the house of Aaron, our part is that we are to go, we are to not just focus on just us, but John, the message that John gave was kind of like the blood. And so we go to the whole body. The whole body should be on our hearts. Mm -hmm. All 12 tribes. And so that's where we, I, for me, I was just sitting there and I'm just, we need, we really, really need the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and direct us to know what our part is and also to start expanding our thinking to be way bigger than just the little scope of what, what we see as ourselves. It's way bigger, you know. And I mean, when you start coming in contact with people from all around the world who have a heart to, for the whole regathering of the whole house of Israel, and they, after John's message, they say, we're Levites. I mean, it's bigger than we can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I guess that's one of the things that came back, uh, when I came back home, it's like, it's so much bigger than we can possibly even imagine. And, but it's also extremely important that we are being led and guided by the Holy Spirit because this is not going to happen without the Holy Spirit. Right. It is not going to happen. Yeah, what's Elijah's work? It's preparation, right? Mm -hmm. He's the one who draws people at the appropriate time. He prepares the way. God is making all of these arrangements. You know, some people like to use the word chance. I don't believe in that. There is a word that I think describes it, but not in a spiritual sense. It's coincidence. And, and that's a very legitimate term, which essentially only means two things coming together at the same, you can use either space or time to say they're coincidental. But it doesn't, it doesn't imply anything probabilistic. Um, humanists will take it that way, but I think we have to see the Holy Spirit. When you see something happen and you're going, wow, how did that happen? If you see that as something that God is doing, you pretty well know how it happened. It happened because the Holy Spirit took those people to the right place where he wanted them to be. Just it, like it, that movie. Yeah, just like in the movie. It's so divine appointment everywhere. Yeah. It's like, the, wow. How many of you saw the movie today? Okay. There were only a few of us. The, the best part, and I heard Joy say, oh, I just love this part. I just love it. <laughs> this, this, guy, this guy is in Jerusalem, and he's going out ministering to people, and God's telling him, hey, this guy has a problem. And so he observes this guy who has a problem walking and he, and he blesses his leg and, and his back and all of this, and he walks off and he's looking pretty good when he's walking off. And then he runs into this other guy and, 
and his brother or dad or something has a problem, he goes over to minister him, and then he says, you know what we really would like to do is to get in into the, to the, to the Temple Mount, Dome of the Rock. And the guy says, ah, you can't pull that off. And he says, well, we'd really like to do that. And he said, well, I may know a guy. <laughs> so, so he leads them around through, I don't know, they walked about five miles, leads them around to this. It's the guy in the yellow shirt that he'd been <laughs> he ministering to it. earlier. <laughs> and, and at the end of it, the guy says, I don't know. He says, I'm a Muslim. You couldn't, Americans couldn't pay me thousands of dollars to get in the door. But something told me I needed to take you guys in. And he took them in with cameras. They went underneath the, the rock down into the well of souls. I mean, it's like, really? Now, if you can't see that as God ordained, you're missing the picture. And our problem is we get used to thinking, well, nothing special is going to happen. It's a question of your expectations, really. And, and expectations go with desire. So that, that's why I keep putting out here, what's your desire? So you can be willing for something to happen. That means you're just going to permit it. You're not going to oppose it. You can accept it and work with it. That's kind of the next step. But if you desire it, you will work to make it happen. And, and that's really the challenge that we face is what's our desire? And, and God honors desire. Okay, you remember the parable about the, the workers and some of them went in early and some of them went in late. I think it applies to desire as well. Whatever, you des whatever desire you come up with, whenever you come up with it, throw it out there and see what God will do with it. Because he's not going to make you do things that are outside of your abilities. But he will enable you to do things that you can do and maybe you don't realize it. And so that kind of takes me to my, to my last one is confidence. How much confidence do we have that this will work? Not here, but here. You have to know in your heart that this is a no-risk deal. That there is nothing that you're going to lose that's of any value by going after what God wants. Because if you're going the wrong direction, he'll change your direction. If your heart's desire is to serve him, just go some direction and see what he works with. Uh, you're much better to be moving than you are not. Okay? Yeah, Derek, he wasn't said that God can't move. He can't use, move a park car. No, can't steer. Can't, can't steer a park car. Park. Yeah. You can move the wheels around, scrub the rubber off in one place, but that's about it. So, so I think that's part of, confidence and desire to me are the two biggest things we need to be, uh, to be dealing with with ourselves. You know, we have, we have, not only are we pretty good at lying to ourselves, but we have an enemy who helps us out, okay? And he not only does that inside of us, he does that with people around us. He uses a lot of reinforcements. But we've got to have the confidence that whatever God decides we're going to do, if we are willing to serve him, no holds barred, by the way. Some of those people end up in places I wouldn't have gone. But if we're willing, and really I think that's what you have to do every morning is get up and say, I don't have a clue how this day is going to go, but I'm willing to go your way. Just fasten your seatbelt and see what happens. Because if, if, that's, if what you said was honest, you'll see some interesting things happen that day. Now, are we ready for guests? Well, there's always house cleaning. All right, I mean... You, things get messy and you have to deal with that. And there's sometimes you have a job that takes you off over here and you miss some of what's going on over there and you, you just can't get too upset about that. I mean, if God wanted you over there, he'd have gotten you over there. But most likely he wanted you over here. We have to stop judging the value of our experiences. Because 
if God is doing them, they're all good. We have a, we have a very distorted sense of valuation. Uh, and, and a lot of it comes from the flesh, a lot of it comes from society. It, it, how many issues do we hear about where people have self-worth issues, the suicide rate is just exploding, uh, and, and you think the enemy isn't part of that? So part of our job is, is to stay steady. It's to say, I'm not going to be pushed around by those things. So we do need to get rid of stuff. Anybody have any stuff here? You know, they can't figure out somebody else who would use it or be dumb enough to buy it from us. That's what eBay is for, by the way. So I think the question at this point is, what is our desire? Going through this process of Shavuot, God has promised to do certain things. But they won't be true in us unless we are prepared to receive them. Part of that's desire. Part of that's confidence to pursue what God is doing. Part of it is preparation that he knows we need and so he's going to take us someplace. We have to be willing to cooperate in that situation. You know, if, if we, like Paul says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. You know, sometimes we think we're prepared, but we're not. And God does not allow us to go out and be destroyed because of our lack of understanding of the situation. So he puts us someplace else. Don't get too worried about that. Let him make the arrangements, because he will. But be ready to accept the opportunities. One of the things that I've noticed is if I sit around and think about a possibility while it's happening, it evaporates. I'll see somebody that needs some help and, it, and I don't stop fast enough to go back and, and go help them. Don't overthink the situation. You're better off to take a chance up front and then not have to, to do something than you are to miss it. Because every one of those opportunities is a potential blessing for you and certainly for them and and we don't want to do anything stupid but I think we could take a whole lot more what we perceive to be risks if we know what God is saying to us at any particular time you know when I was building that house I cut a lot of things apart because I put them together wrong but I never injured myself in that whole project so I feel like I was blessed. And as we consider assembling our own house, the house of Levi and the house of Aaron, in obedience to this uh, command that, that we're part of because of Maurice Glendening, then I think we have to have that same expectation. We're not going to know all the answers, but we are going to work together. And he is going through his Holy Spirit to give us the instructions to accomplish the task. So, I don't, I don't think I even want to say this as a challenge, might, might be in some senses, but I think it's the attitude that we have to have. We have to have desire and we have to have confidence. Now, making those things a reality maybe is the challenge. Do we get up every morning and say, all right, God, I got my seatbelt on, where are we going? You know, if you say, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do today, you better understand what that statement means. Because it could be a wild ride. But, in my experience, it's exciting. You know, you see these people doing X Games and all these other extreme sports. I would venture to say that building the kingdom of God and gathering his house is going to be way better than any of that. And, and the Holy Spirit and endorphins are two different things. <laughs> so, Greg, one more.
So what is happening? Why is it? Not why. I don't even mean to say it that way. Put yourself in a position to say, this is what God's doing with me today. And then give it out. Show it. Demonstrate that. And I think that that's where it's at. Where I think that we, we get to a point where we talk about building a house. And that's where it stays. We talk about building a house. And we never get, not never. We have a hard time getting to the point where we actually start putting the boards together and start dealing with it in a constructive way. And, and that, it's kind of what's been on my heart, like with 143. We have a hard time even getting together and talking the commandments. Mm -hmm. And if we have a hard time with that, we'll never be ready. So, but, so what? But, but, but what I'm saying, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you or anything, but what I'm saying and what I think of the Spirit reinforcing in me is saying, get off your whatever and go for it. Don't talk about it. And Over you, your tush. Talking about it is good. <laughs> yeah, Discussion is good. But get up and start going. And that's, like I say, I, that's just me. And that's stirring in, in me quite a bit. And that's not in any way criticism of anybody else. But, you know, if I talk about it too much more, I might find that the time goes by, and then I'll look back and say, well, why didn't I do anything? Yeah, well, perfect example was I finally realized one day while I was planning to build this house, that I could watch all of the This Old House episodes there were and never build a house. I mean, I would know a lot about how other people built houses, but it wasn't going to do anything for mine. So, so I guess I would give you one challenge. One of the things in the Levitical writings, it says, nothing new will be given until what I have already given you has been done. I would challenge you, I guess, to go look and see what have we been given that we haven't done. Because if you want to move beyond where you are, you have to have satisfied all of those requirements of preparation to get more. So may maybe that's a, a place that you could go. But I would say also, this is like John was talking about speaking in tongues today. I think you have to be willing and able to go to the Lord and say, I do not have a clue what to do next and let him lead you. Because there are so many things we don't know and so many things that confuse us that we have to be able to take that approach to, to let go of our pride and say, I always know what to do next, which makes you a liar, and say, I don't have a clue what to do. Lead me. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's what we have access to. And hopefully, in our getting together, we will be blessed to know how to use that resource better. Because we've been called to do a job. If we desire to pull it off, then we've got to have the knowledge, the training, the direction, whatever it is that in the business world, any supervisor would give you. And, and God is the best supervisor you're ever going to get. Actually, the Holy Spirit's probably the supervisor. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, it, this is where the confidence comes in. We have to be able to say, I desire it. Now, desire is different from a wish, by the way. A wish is something more like, accept. I sure would like to see that happen, but I don't want to be any part of it. Okay. It's like my mom. She wanted to be better, but she didn't want to get better. That was going to hurt. I mean, it was a lot of work. And frankly, at her age, it was a lot of work. But we have to be willing to take the approach. And th this is my view of sacrifice. Is that you give up whatever you could have done in favor of something that has more value. That you know has more value 
your heart has to tell you it has enough more value to get you off your tush. It, God is not going to make you get up and do the things he asked you to do. You remember the parable about the two, the two sons? And the father said, go out and do this. And the one said, I will. And he didn't. And the other one said, I'm not having any part of that. Turned around and went back and did it. It's kind of like Cecilia was talking about this morning, correcting papers and stuff. It was the one who actually did it that was credited for his effort. And that's why I say, do something. Say, God, I want to make progress. Go do something. See how he changes your direction. Because he will. Joy? Yeah, I was, uh, I, think, I think God uses each one of us. Um, when we open ourselves, he can use each one of us just by the natural gifts that we have. I mean, I talk, so nobody knows that. But, um, really? <laughs> But sometimes if I'm feeling frustrated and I just go, what, what else? I, I just feel like there's more, there's more to my life than just cleaning. You know? I, I mean, I'm cleaning a lot of things. And all the women said, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so sometimes when I am in the middle of cleaning, I'll have somebody that will be on my heart. And sometimes right in the middle of mopping my floor or something else, it's like there's an insistence. I'm supposed to call that person or text them or something. And so this happens to me a lot. So I've learned how to mock and talk at the same time. <laughs> because that's what happens. And so the other day, I hadn't talked to somebody for a long time on the phone. And this one particular person, and oh boy, I couldn't get her off my mind. And I thought, I got to do it. So I called her, and if you know what? It was one of those, I just knew, I just knew that I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. Because she was in a very low place, and the more we talked, she got a little more animated, and by the time we finished and we prayed together, the Holy Spirit had, you know, done the work. And so... I guess what I'm saying is, is that if you have somebody that's on your heart, even in the middle of the night when you, you know, you're somebody, that's the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and, and either you're supposed to be praying for them or else call them the next day or write, mm -hmm. you know, write a card or do something. But that's, that's the Holy Spirit. That's one of the ways that the Holy Spirit can be using us out here in the middle of the desert, you know. When you, sometimes when we feel frustrated. And all of us have family members. All of us have a sphere of contact where we can be helping other people that we know. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the ways that we can be building our house. Because there's a lot of restoration and healing that needs to happen. Well, with all of our loved ones. Or otherwise, this building would be full of the 760 people that have been baptized. And, and don't bet that you're the only one, by the way. You know, God may put something on your heart. He may have put it on six or seven other people's heart. You're just part of the deal. Mm -hmm. We probably need to close. And, and I, what I wanted to do, uh, since Joy brought that up, my definition of joy, no pun intended, is the knowledge that you did God's will. If you act on one of those things and you recognize the value that it brought to someone else or a situation, that's joy. That's the real thing. That's, that's somehow the sound of your treasure in heaven ringing in your ears. And, and you know that it was worth doing. So I just say as we go through the rest of this weekend, think about the Holy Spirit. Think about your desire. Think about your confidence or lack of it, and think about your willingness to go before the Lord in whatever situation you're in and say, this is what I need. You know, I don't know how to do this, and I know I'm supposed to. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. And watch what happens. Because he promised. And he who promised is faithful. We've got to count on that. So...
Amen. Amen. Shavuot Shalom. We are, we are in the 50th day. So, thank you. And thank that stool. I'll stand. John says we all have to go to bed because we have to be here at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that you have blessed us with to assemble uh, at this time, at this Moed, the, the feast of of Shavuot, the Holy Spirit. We recognize that there is still work to be done, but we see what happened when the Holy Spirit came uh, in Jerusalem. And we recognize that you have gifts for each and every one of us to, to do your work. And that first gift, that down payment, is your Holy Spirit that you have promised uh, that you would lead us and guide us so we ask today that you help us to listen for that Holy Spirit, that you would calm our minds and be able to hear the things that you are saying over, uh, over the noise of this world. And we would ask that you would give us the direction, the understanding that we need to accomplish the tasks we've already been given and to prepare us for what more you have for each and every one of us. It is our desire that our house would be prepared to accept the people that you are calling, not only in the work of Levi and Aaron, but in gathering all of Israel and those who might come with them in, in Yeshua. We thank you that you're doing this throughout the world, and we recognize that there are other people we will come in contact with that are, that are doing your will and your work. Show us how we can become one with them and be strong through your Holy Spirit as we work together. So we thank you for this opportunity this weekend. We thank you that you are with each and every one of us as we, uh, as we go about your business. And so we thank you what's been given and made available to us through our Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. The cooler is short, I made it. <laughs>